It's 2024, and if you want to get your shit together in your business, then you need to mind the gap. Right now, you can grab an early bird bonus when you enroll in my digital bookkeeping course, Mind the Gap. Visit my link tree in the show notes to enroll, and you'll be invited to book a one-on-one virtual call with me. We're going to strategize and set you on the path for financial success in your business. This call is free for new students of Mind the Gap, and it's currently a $500 value. The course will be available starting in May 2024, but don't wait to grab your free bonus and get into our online community. Everyone who enrolls in Mind the Gap right now will receive an exclusive invitation to join our virtual community. I'm going live in there twice a month to teach you valuable financial content, answer your business questions, we're co-working together, and you'll be able to network with other entrepreneurs who are doing this work too. All of my clients are there already, and we're so excited to meet you. Visit the show notes to get enrolled in Mind the Gap today. All right, welcome everybody to another episode of Money Through Ease. I have a guest with me today. It's Courtney Cave from Northwest Money Coaching. Hi, Courtney. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do because we have a little bit of overlap going on between what I do for my business and what you do. So tell us who you are. Yes, I was so excited to chat today and just get to talk to your audience. Um, so because I know they'll get a lot of value us having mm-hmm. such a crossover. Mm-hmm. So I'm very much in the world of daily money management with business mm-hmm. finances. So all those habits and behaviors that contribute um, to our profitability or not, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> making sure that business owners are, and I know you do this too, not commingling, they're paying themselves mm-hmm. first, they're setting aside money for taxes, you know, doing all the things that will help keep help them keep loving their business because mm. a lot of times our businesses start out as a dream and it's our passion and then we get going and there's all these things that we have to do and if we aren't set up with a firm foundation it can quickly become something that burns us out so mm-hmm. i'm super passionate about helping business owners not burn out keep loving their business and do it through effective daily money management. Excellent. Yeah. I don't do a lot of like day-to-day money management. The most that I do for my clients who hire me to do their bookkeeping for them is like monthly done for you. But like, I also will provide like accounts receivable support and receipt management during the month. But um, people either come to me when they're established and they're hustling and they've got money coming in and they're just wild about they're just totally eaten up with their business or or I have people come to me in the very beginning stages of their business and they're like I have no idea what I'm doing um I'm not really making that much money and so I don't really get anybody that falls in between um but yeah it's so important as business owners to pay ourselves first I have been in business for almost two years now and I'm just getting to the point where I can like pay myself on a regular basis. Like mm-hmm. my cash flow was not supporting that for most of last year. Like it was okay, if I need to pay a bill, hopefully there's money in the business account that I can take out and then pay myself. So do you mm-hmm. find that there is that kind of time at the very beginning of your business where, you know, some people don't have like a uh, savings or they don't have a full-time job or they quit their full-time job and they don't have like other funding to support their business and themselves. And so, you know, it sometimes winds up being like a grind for a little bit. Is that your experience with your clients too? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, you, you start a business and you, it is a grind because you may be pressed on time, whether you Mm. were a stay at home mom and now you're a work at home mom and you're trying Mm. to find time to work on your business or you're working a full-time job And now you're starting up this business and you reach a point where, oh my gosh, I can't keep doing this, of working this many hours. It comes to that breaking point of like, when do I jump Mm, and mm, just go all mm. in on my, my side business and make it my, my full-time business. So yeah, it's absolutely a grind in the beginning to get a new business off the ground for sure. Yeah. And it's like, how do we know when is the right time? Sometimes you have a plan. Sometimes you've got funding. Sometimes the numbers make sense, but sometimes they don't. And you're put in that position where you make that decision anyways, because it's what you need to do for other areas of your life. And like you brought up, like many stay at home moms or women who are tasked with the child rearing in their families and like homemaking and taking care of the home and the kind of family economics of it all are like, well, I could squeeze in like a side gig, even though like child rearing, 
homemaking are all kind of full-time gigs already and they want to support their family financially as well so they're like well I'm at home I could do something here um tell us what it's like to work with those folks what kind of like advice would you have to give or you know what what kind of journey does that look like for stay-at-home moms well that's exactly what I did so I'm so glad you asked you Mm -hmm. know um I when I first did all this, I was really passionate about helping other stay at home moms do this too, because Mm -hmm. what I found myself in and what many other women find themselves in is, or dads who stay at home, right. Um, Mm -hmm. is sometimes there's this gap that's like, Ooh, if I could just Mm -hmm. bring in a few extra hundred dollars, that would be huge for my family. Just need a little more breathing room. That's a grocery bill nowadays, a couple hundred dollars. (laughs) That's inflation for groceries. Yeah. (laughs) that's what we need that money for. And so you're right. On the one hand, being the household, uh, the chief household officer, right? Mm, Like to call that mm -hmm. the CHO, Mm -hmm. that is a more than full-time job. You are wearing so many hats. And so um, finding the time to carve out to build a business is like, can I even do that? And the answer is you have, you do it, you do it. If you can find, if you can make the time, if you can carve mm-hmm. out the time. So mm-hmm. I remember in the beginning stages of my business, it's been almost four years now. Um, I had seven hours a week to work on my business. So mm-hmm. I got up at 5am before my kids were up. I do not mm-hmm. like getting up early in the morning for the record, <laughs> but that was when I had to, I couldn't talk. I couldn't do a lot of work with them. And, and I was trying to find that balance of do I want to do work while I'm with them also? Like how do I want to be where my feet are too? Yeah. And so mm-hmm. I was getting up super early in the morning to work on what I call silver hours work. Your silver hours are like administrative work you can mm-hmm. do. It's not client facing. It's all the back end. Yeah. And my golden hours were the time that I am client facing, that I had protected mm-hmm. time to meet with clients and follow up with leads and all that. And so I had to find time for my silver hours, my golden hours. And it was, I, like I said, in the beginning, probably seven hours a week. And you just start mm. with what you've got. Yeah. And I will say that having profit as a habit from day one is a total game changer for new business owners, because mm. you absolutely cannot make the jump from what you were doing before to going all in on your business. If the profit's not there, you can't just leave a full-time job if you can't replace your income. Um, So profit must be there as a habit from, in my, if you can swing it from day one. Yeah. (laughs) Help people do is take their profit first and build the business around what's left, not the other way around. Yeah, that's so important to kind of know how how all of those pieces work. when we're talking about profit, we're talking about like your business has revenue and then your business has expenses that you get to claim as tax deductions and whatever is left over is the profit. But with, I have not taken like the profit first credentialings or anything. I basic, I understand the concept, but I'm not like a profit first accountant or professional or anything. But my understanding of the concept is like most people sit there and think, well, I'm making this much and I'm spending this much. So what's left over? But when we're considering profit first, or like you're talking about from day one, what do you want to be taking home? Like if you are the stay at home mom that thinks or wants to take home a couple of hundred dollars a month to really help out with the grocery bills, child care, car payments, all of that. How do we work backwards from that number? And why do we want to work backwards from that number? Why is that? I thought the only way was just like plus, minus, whatever's left over. If it's a positive number is what I've got. (laughs) Yeah. And that's what I would say most business owners do is they're like, all right, I got to. I got to make money. And and we, we rush into that part because like either we put startup capital in, we've got an mm. investment here. We need to make, start making a return on our investment for this to be an actual business and not just a hobby. So we're mm. urgent to the money making part, but then we've also got expenses and we're urgent to that because the business needs to keep the doors open. And <laughs> yeah. then we're like, ah, if there's something left over, great. I get to pay myself. I'll work on that over time. Golly and gee, I've got a couple hundred bucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, um, but also like if we worked at an employer and we allowed them to pay us in that manner, that would be unacceptable, right? Mm -hmm. Like we don't get the leftovers of the profit of the business. We get paid on payroll. Like we Mm -hmm. get a paycheck. And so Mm -hmm. 
when we, we don't do that as business owners that we don't treat mm. it in the same way. And so I make the argument that we should be doing that like from day one, even if it's tiny, but we need to establish guardrails to mm. our business spending. Um, we need to set up a flow to save ahead for taxes so that we don't get stressed out at tax time. Right. And we yeah. need routines and habits in place from day one. And if you're listening to this and you're like, Hey, I've been in business five years and I don't do any of that. It's it's way past day <laughs> one. Sister. That's okay too. That is uh-huh. okay. Mm-hmm. There's always a way to start to shift in the direction you want to mm-hmm. go with the right organization and structure. Yeah, I agree completely. I hear some from folks who are like my colleagues, not necessarily my clients, but then I hear people who come to me for assistance and they're like, I just, I don't know what to do. Like I have a full-time job. I'm trying to work as much in my business as I can, but my business has expenses and I'm having to put my personal money into the business. Like it doesn't make sense to pay myself. Like it would just turn Mm -hmm. around and I would just put it back into the business because Canva's coming due and my uh, website domain needs to be renewed. And just like all of those things that we can arguably need to have for a business to be operating. Like some would say like, you really don't need a website. Facebook is free, like, you know, all that. But what would you say to those folks that are like, yeah, I only put my personal money into the business. It's not, I'm not at a place that I can pay myself. Like, how do we start to make that shift? Yeah. The first question I was, I would ask is, do you want this to be a business or do you want it to be a hobby? And by Mm -hmm. the way, there's no shame in wanting something Mm -hmm. to be a hobby, but if you're not profiting um, Mm -hmm. and you're always taking money out of your personal account, you're not really profiting. Right. Mm -hmm. And so everyone has startup capital at some point, like you have, you pay for, I remember I paid for a financial coach training program. Mm -hmm. So I learned how to coach people. That Mm -hmm. was my startup capital. After that point, I, I personally was committed to operating profitably from day one. All right. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm only going to add in business expenses if the profits there, um, Mm. I I'm not going to add on. So so I, I operated from a very minimalistic standpoint, just getting started company of one, a book by Paul Jarvis. That is one of my top favorite business books ever. He talks about this business minimalism Mm. And so, yeah, I would, so to anyone listening, do your expenses make sense right now for the season of business that you're in? If you Mm. are continually infusing personal funds into the business, that should be like a one-time few time thing and not Mm -hmm. an ongoing practice, because then that tells me that the business is not profitable and that your expenses are too high or there's just no money coming in. Um, Mm -hmm. So I would take another look at your ongoing operating expenses and what needs to change in order to start becoming profitable. Yeah. I always tell folks like, well, I'm not going to tell somebody what to do, but me personally, if I'm having to put money into my business to pay for the business expenses and to keep it operating, I would much rather just go make more money than even cut my expenses. Like I'm the gal that's like, all right, let's go talk to some of these leads. Let's go like reach out to my network. Let's make some direct offers. To me, that just sounds more fun and also like less constraining. Like if I can open up my revenue and my business income, that gives me more room. So does restricting your expenses, cutting down on that kind of stuff, but the making more money part sounds way more fun to me. So I personally, yeah, you're so right. There's two <laughs> sides of the coin. It's not yeah. just about looking at your expenses, it's about looking at your income. And so having an abundance mindset into like, Hey, all right. If the numbers aren't making sense over here, I got to go make more money or yeah. maybe <laughs> both. So I love that you pointed yeah. that out. Because there's really two sides of the coin. Yeah. And there's so many ways that you can approach that as like, uh, I don't really want to call it a problem, but like maybe a puzzle to solve. Like what pieces can we kind of move around here to start making that shift? But it's really important to have that mindset of like my business needs to support me financially. Like that's the point of the business, not only to serve my clients and like I have my mission and my vision statement that are like, you know, where I want the business to go, what kind of impact I want to have on the entrepreneurial community, but also like I got bills to pay. (laughs) It costs money to be here. So yeah. And taking a look at like what you want, what you need your take-home pay to be a super important, like you had said before, reverse engineering it. Okay. What do Mm -hmm. I want or need to be bringing home for my family? And then, Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's 
certain percentages you can set up for yourself. Like, okay, I'm going to set aside 15% for taxes or, or I want to pay myself 50% for my business, which is what yeah. I help people do. Okay, great. If I'm paying myself 50% for my business, then my take-home pay, I need to double that. And that's how much revenue I need to make every month. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's such a, and I love algebra and math girly. I love puzzles. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, mm -hmm. all right, if I've got a puzzle like that to solve, I can also step back from it emotionally that like, uh, has anything to do with like my worth or value as a person or a business owner or an accountant, bookkeeper, or whatever. Like it's just a puzzle to solve. It's just something that I can sit here and move some pieces around and work through it and figure out what are my options. And that sounds like more fun than, uh, you know, telling myself that I'm not good enough or people don't want to hire me and like all of yeah. those kind of mindset things that we can totally get stuck in sometimes that keeps us from making those good decisions. Yeah. Do you yeah. help your clients with like mindset too? Absolutely. Because, um, you know, part of, like you said, part of the equation is the income piece. So yeah, there are those moments where I'm working with someone, we're talking about the numbers and they just have imposter syndrome or, oh, I couldn't charge that much. And, um, or they don't think their service is worth that much or, their services are not diversified enough. It's like, Hey, you could be providing this service right now. What, what do you mm -hmm. think about that? And so, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely a lot of, oh, I won't say everything is mindset, but when you become a business owner, so much mindset <laughs> work comes to play that needs to be done yeah. that you never would have known if you hadn't started a business. Yeah. And here's the thing that I think people it might be helpful for people to kind of soak in is that like, if you had like a funder or like an angel investor or some sort of capital funding that like, wasn't your money that you didn't have to pay back. Someone was just like, here's a hundred grand, go start a business. You would still have to do the mindset shit. Even yeah. if you had money to like front a business and like get it going and also pay yourself and like take care of yourself in the meantime, while it became profitable, you would mm -hmm. still have the mindset work to do. Like that's so important to like, taken <laughs> and be like, all right, you know, I want to start a business, but I recognize that I've got maybe some mindset things that need to be worked on either before I take that step, before I quit my job, or even during the process of like getting it up and going. Yeah, there's mindset work, but there's also a big logistical learning curve mm -hmm. I found. Um mm -hmm. just wearing every single hat. And, you know, it's one thing if you've like managed someone else's business mm -hmm. before, but then really mm -hmm. taking on all those roles, bookkeeper, marketer, sales, yeah. customer service, like on and on. It's, it's kind of a shock to the system. Like what? Oh, yeah. I gotta, I gotta be all the things. Um, so it's yeah. definitely <laughs> a mindset work and logistical learning curve to contend with. Yeah, I've had so many people that I've met that have like business degrees or master's degrees and they're just like, I have no idea. Like I maybe know how all the pieces are supposed to play with each other, but being in that role, wearing all the different hats, most of us have had one, maybe two of those areas that we've worked in before, but all of a sudden it's all incumbent on you. Even if you hire like a virtual assistant or somebody to help you with different pieces of that puzzle, it's still incumbent on you to make sure it gets done. Like you're still, the passing of the book stops with you. <laughs> yeah, every entrepreneur is, um, they have their craft and then they have, they are the business owner and they mm -hmm. are two totally separate things. And that's mm -hmm. why I think a lot of business owners struggle with the financial piece because- they're really good at their craft, whether it's a yeah. product or a service. And now they're having to manage business finances. Yeah. I've worked with, or even personal finances. Like I've worked with financial advisors who really needed help with their personal finances. It's like you do finances for a living, but not really. They were doing investments in portfolios and stock mm -hmm. management, which is mm -hmm. totally different from personal mm -hmm. finance. So, um, you know, it really is a different animal, like owning a business and doing your craft. Yeah, totally. Can you tell us a little bit about what inspires you or what inspired your entrepreneurial journey? I mean, you've talked a little bit about being a stay-at-home mom and also wanting to like financially provide for your family. What inspires you? What does your day-to-day -day kind of look like in your business? Yeah, what inspired me was I worked in retail coffee for 11 years mm -hmm. and a lot of that time was in management. So I had run. That sounds super people, fun. <laughs> other people's businesses and um uh -huh. 
Yeah, I know. It just, at that point, the caffeine was just in my veins, right? Like, um, <laughs> I just was always caffeinated and it didn't affect me at all <laughs> after a time. Um, and I, once I had my second son, you know, I had two under two, I decided to stay home and I, I wanted to be a stay at home mom. You know, we had lived in Southern California, we moved to Oregon and that gave us the financial means to have that choice. Southern mm. California is very much a dual income household kind of, kind of place. Yeah. To live. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so we were blessed to have that option for me to stay home. And so I did for a year, but to be totally honest, I felt so drained by doing mm. that. And I knew that the work was what I should be doing at the time. And my kids needed me and that was precious time. Mm. But I also feel like God had given me some gifts that I wasn't able to exercise and like mm. serve others with. And um, <laughs> I just, it, I ultimately felt really unfulfilled on like doing one and not doing both. And I was like, I want to do both. I want to mm. my babies and I want to um, serve people in a professional way and like use what I felt like gifts that were given to me to, um, help other people. Um, yeah. and so, um, yeah, so then I did, I found out about, you know, the training I did, I did the training and yeah, I, I just really wanted, I was just so passionate about personal finance and it's mm. funny because I used to be like an out of control spender and didn't know what saving <laughs> even meant. And uh -huh. so to help, I could, could relate. What's to a budget? Family. I don't oh, know. Oh, well, what's a budget? Yeah. Like my husband would joke that I, if I had 25 cents left in my bank account, I would take it out and get a gumball. Like I just had a, a hole <laughs> burning in my pocket. Okay. Mm. So my mom still laughs to this day that I'm a financial coach. Like she just knows how I used to spend. <laughs> And I think it makes me really qualified to help people, you know? Uh -huh. um, yeah. So my financial habits are much different these days, but yeah, I was motivated um, to serve others and to bring in income to my family. And we get to do so much because of my income these days, um, things that we wouldn't able be able to do otherwise. So that's what I'm motivated by is just, you know, mm. using the gifts I feel like God's given me and serving my family too, by bringing in income. I love that. And I, I don't have children and I can't really relate to doing something that is necessary that you want to do like that, like childcare, which is skilled labor mm -hmm. that never stops. Like yeah. you're 24 seven providing really a labor source uh, <laughs> and yeah. then wanting to kind of like, not only be present with your children and like take care of them and provide that, uh, just childcare and like homemaking and all of that, like it's a hard job. And then on top of that, I love that you wanted to serve other people too and find a way to kind of make both of those parts of you mesh and work together and have time for each so that you feel fulfilled, right? Because that's very important. And if you had two children under two, like, man, <laughs> that is yeah. like um, saturated with... <laughs> caring for them and just having to constantly be watching them. That's a big job. So I love that story that, you know, it was still a calling that you recognize you are a mother, you want to be there and be present for them, but you also have other things that you want to accomplish in your life. Um, what kind of like tips would you give to yourself one year, five years, 10 years ago um, that, you know, I don't like to look back on the past with like any sort of regret, but maybe lessons learned. Like if I could have done something differently, what would I have done differently five, 10 years ago? Just in general or with the business or? Yeah, in general or with the business or with the clients. I mean, anything that you can offer to the audience to like uh, maybe repeat a lesson that they've already heard or drive a point home. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because when I ask myself that like, what are, what's my goal for the next five years? Like when I take any five-year period of my life at all, I'm like, and then look forward. I'm like, I never knew I was going to be there in five yeah. years, like yeah. every single slice. Um, and so it's just, it, life is funny that way. But, um, if I were, if, yeah, it's, it's funny. Cause I don't have regrets, um, on how I've operated my business necessarily, I guess, there is one lesson I learned. Um, you know, one time I invested in a program that was more money than I had spent on any business expense ever, really. 
um, mm. and it promised a lot and under delivered. And while mm. I did learn a lot through that experience, um, it's so easy to emotionally spend in our business um, mm. and personally, right? Um, thinking that, oh, this is just going to be the thing that solves everything for me. And so I would caution people if they are having those feelings about a purchase, whether on the personal side or business side, to like get some accountability in your life and mm. talk to someone else who you trust about it first, because you are in your own mind and you're isolated. Well, it could be a really good thing. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes just things are just too good to be true. And like, they're yeah. just marketed so well. And like, yeah. you know, marketing is not evil. It's just, we want to make a decision from a place where we have a solid financial foundation. In my choice, I compromised my financial foundation by making mm. that decision. And I was really mm -hmm. ashamed of that. Mm. And so looking back, I'm like, you know, it would have been better if I would have talked to more people about the decision, not made a decision in isolation and reckon and and ran different scenarios for myself, how I could achieve a similar result in a less expensive way, or in a way that wouldn't at least compromise my financial foundation. So that's, that's really one of the biggest lessons I've learned in business, um, in terms yeah. of like something that I may have changed or wanted to go back and do mm. differently. That would be it. I appreciate you sharing that because, um, regardless of whether we intend to move through life without regrets, there are going to be choices that we make when we look back and we're like, that could have been different. <laughs> um, and, you know, instead of like indulging in the shame about it, um, you know, even after the fact, in, in the moment, like you said, we buy things emotionally. And this is something that I've got coached on from my sales coach. It's like, people do buy a feeling that they want to have. Like they're buying your, they're spending money on your services or whatever value that you've communicated to them because they think it's going to make them feel differently. And there's nothing wrong with that. But like, I always try to make sure that I have like an informed audience or an informed person on the other end of a conversation with me so that like, I want them to make a good choice for their business and for themselves personally, that it has nothing to do with me really. Yeah. And what would you recommend for like before, during, or at, even after, like, how do we find that sense of community as entrepreneurs? Because when we're solopreneurs, it can be a very isolated experience like you're talking about. Um, how do we find that community? How do we build that community with other entrepreneurs so that when we have those moments or even after the moment we've made a decision, how can we lean on the support from that community to help us do better next time? That's a great question because you're so right. This work can be isolating when you're a solopreneur. I don't have coworkers right next to me <laughs> across the screen from me. And so um, all the introverts might hate me for saying this. I am an introvert myself, but you need to, <laughs> find it. You need to go yeah. create your community and find mm. your tribe and actively seek out that community. And I think it can be hard to make friends as adults. It just, it is, mm. um, I, I feel that, but here's one thing that I did. Um, my city, it's a relatively small town and we did not have any women's networking groups, like a women mm. owned businesses of my city group. And yeah. so I just started one, like I just rounded up some gals on Facebook and um, found some other business owners from other groups. And I'm like, hey, do you guys mm. want to meet up like once a month? We'll network. We'll have a little talk. You know, do you guys want to do that? And we've been meeting for like a year and a half now and we've yeah. grown. And I, yes, I hear all the introverts <laughs> squirming when I'm talking about this, <laughs> but you got to put yourself out there if you don't want to be lonely and mm. you don't you're not meant to do this work alone. So yeah. go out and start with finding one person to talk to. Ask mm -hmm. if you can meet on a regular basis with them, like just to talk business and encourage each other, talk shop, maybe once a month, but put yourself out there. That's how you do it. It's not, it's not just magically going to happen probably. Yeah, totally. I live in the South. I live in Louisiana and um, there is at least one kind of women's business group that I'm aware of, but I'm like, not really my vibe. <laughs> yeah. it can and, be... and that's okay because um, <laughs> the gal that I co-created this group with, 
the chamber of commerce was not really her vibe, you know, or like mm -hmm, whatever mm -hmm. it was she was a part of before. And she's like, I wish we could create this kind of, I'm like, Hey, I want to create that group too. And so we co-created it together. So if, if there's something out there, that's not your vibe, start your own group. Like, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Cause yeah, chances are what's out there might not be appealing to you. So what is, and then go do it mm -hmm. easier said than done, but I did it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think if you approach it really with like a solid intention that you've um, examined and evaluated for yourself, like, why do I want to start this? And then go into with that intention that you'll automatically kind of call in the people who share that, you know, mission with you or who want that experience for themselves. And I agree the chambers of commerce can be um, a little old and stuffy in a suit kind of like <laughs> vibes. Yeah. Um <laughs> Although there are like younger people coming up and, you know, getting into those organizations and kind of revamping a little bit, but also like the internet exists, y'all. And like ever yeah. since COVID, like we've all become so much more connected online, I feel. And even if you are in a small town or you don't know a lot of people who live around you who own businesses, like you can go online and find people very quickly who want to be a part of whatever it is that you're doing. Exactly. Yeah. And make it how you like it. Like if you're starting a group, you get to call the shots. So like yeah. we dress casually, we bring a snack and wine and we yeah. have a fun <laughs> talk plan that everyone's actually really interested in hearing about, you know, so make it your mm -hmm. own thing. Yeah. Bring us your crudery board, like yes. bring a bottle of wine, <laughs> make it happen. Um, what would you like to share with the audience um, that would be like a practical tip or something that they can take home today to really start to shift their mindset, start to move towards taking home what they want to take home or being a profitable business um, and share maybe a little bit about how your services and the coaching that you do can help people make that shift in their lives and their businesses. Yeah. So if you've been listening to us and you're like, okay, that all sounds great, but on a practical level, like step-by-step, step, how do yeah. I <laughs> put something like this into place? Yeah. And I have created an online course, you know, self-paced option to really start putting the structure in place for yourself. Mm -hmm. And essentially it's made of three main parts. The first part is like you need to stop co-mingling, you know, it walks you through mm -hmm. how to unmingle. I know Reagan's excited. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love the <laughs> separation to... of church and state in the book. Yes. Unmingle. <laughs> so we walk you through how, how to do that. Um, what business bank accounts should you even have? We walk you mm -hmm. through that. Um, taking a look at your cash flow. There, there are so many business owners or owners I talk to who don't know what they're making in one month or how much they're spending in one month. Yeah. So Gaining awareness into your habits is really important. Um, the second main- Y'all know that I agree with that message too. Yes, you gotta be yeah. aware of what's going on before you can make any choices. <laughs> exactly. Um, and to the point of what we were talking about earlier in terms of um, accounting and bookkeeping and all that, this is different. This is budgeting. Like I help mm -hmm. you stay uh, accounting is so important. Um, I won't uh, under, I, I want to underscore the importance of accounting and accurate record keeping for taxes and all that budgeting is going to help you stay aware all month long and not mm -hmm. just get to the end of the month and be like, Oh crap, you know, that all yeah. happened. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's yeah. really the heart behind what all this is on my end is daily money management. Um, mm -hmm. and so part two, it's picking percentages to start setting aside for taxes, which you need to talk to your tax pro to know that number. Um, yeah. What you want to pay yourself, the guardrails you want to put around your business spending. We determine what those numbers should be because if we're not if we're not putting guardrails around any of those things, it's just a free for all, right? And then where we get to tax time and panic because we haven't set anything aside, or we realize that our business is a hobby because we haven't been paying ourselves and we're infusing it with personal money mm -hmm. every month. Um, so we have to put, I, I, that's just the best word for it. Guardrails into place. Yeah. Uh, that starts with knowing what you've been doing and measuring mm -hmm. that and then mm -hmm. working towards your ideal state too. um, creating a business yeah. budget for your expenses. That's super important. And then the last kind of main part is, to all this is establishing your new payday. Like I'm going <laughs> to pay myself now, you know, yeah. pay so you have all the accounts. You pay yourself, set aside money for taxes, put money into your expenses account. So you develop this new 
monthly routine where you mm. are in control, which is so, so important. Um, so that is called the pay yourself first playbook. And that is my online self-paced course. Um, Reagan, since you're having me on here, I, you know, an idea popped into my head, um, just for your listeners, mm -hmm. they I actually will, if they wanted to check out the course and enroll in the course, I will also include a one-on-one, -on -one, one hour setup call, um, to awesome. help them with their business budget, because there are so many questions and factors when you get going with putting the structure into place for yourself. And I know that can be hard if you're completely on your own doing this course and you're not really mm. sure, like you might get stuck on something. So I'd love to be able to sit down and help you with the setup so that you can fly through this course and put this um, structure into place for yourself. So we'll include a link in the show notes to that. But that's really a step-by-step -step guide into how to put the structure in place for yourself for effective daily money management in your business to be more profitable, take home more money from your business into your pocket mm -hmm. and pay yourself first. Establish a payday. Love to hear that. And I think the work that you do and the work that I do actually does mesh so well together because like you said, you kind of have to know what you've been doing in order to make changes. And that is the work that I do is like establishing that record of like what happened, you know, what did you spend money on? And then you come over to Courtney and she's going to tell you, okay, we're going <laughs> to, we're going to exactly. put up these guardrails. We're going to decide on a payday for you. And that is truly what it boils down to with business finances is like knowing what's been going on in your business, establishing a plan and doing your best to stick with it, you know, developing habits. And I love a good routine. So happy to hear that you help people establish a routine because when we can get on those habits. I think it just winds up being so much easier and it be it's it just becomes like you become a creature of habit. Like you're just not having to spend so much time thinking about those decisions when you have a plan in place. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, you can have the best intentions, you can set up this beautiful business budget, but if if we don't know your historical data from accounting, from bookkeeping, yeah. We can't make a realistic plan. So that is an integral piece to this puzzle is knowing yeah. where you're starting so that you can turn the dial slightly into the direction you want to go because we can't just say, all right, I'm going to start doing this, but you've been doing this for perhaps a decade or like there's going to be habits yeah. in there. So we need to be realistic about our starting point and then turn the dial in the direction you want to go over time. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing with our listeners um, the opportunity not only to sign up for your course, but providing them the access to get a call with you. That's really great. And I love that. And uh, go ahead and share anything else you want listeners to know, like where we can come find you and follow you and be in your orbit and see all of that you've got going on. Yeah. So I hang out mostly on Instagram. That's where you're going to find me. My handle is uh, Courtney.cave and it's Courtney without a U dot K A V as in Victor E H. And then my website is NorthwestMoneyCoaching.com. So that's where you can find me. Amazing. And we'll have all of her links in the show notes. Go get signed up for her course and get on a call with her if you need to seriously change up your money habits in your business. Thank you, Thanks, Courtney, Megan. so much for being on the episode. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Money Through Ease. If you found value in today's discussion, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and leave a rating and review. Your feedback really does mean a lot to me. And if you're ready to take the first step towards organized finances, be sure to download my free receipt organization guide, Chaos to Calm. Visit the link in the show notes to grab your free copy now. Remember, your financial journey starts with small steps. I'm here to support you every step of the way. Until next time, this is Reagan Bashara from Money Through Ease. Stay empowered.